All right, now we're looking at urbanization and American culture in the post-Civil War period. So on the Statue of Liberty, we have a poem, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these, the homeless, the tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. This poem was The New Colossus written by Emma Lazarus, and it foreshadows a large part of the immigration of this time period. So in the last half of the 19th century, the U.S. population more than tripled from about 23.2 million in 1850 to 76.2 million in 1900. The arrival of 16.2 million immigrants fueled the peak of growth. Um, an arrival of 8.8 .8 million more arrived during the peak years of immigration from 1901 to 1910. Pushes pushing people away from their homelands to America included poverty, um, overcrowding and joblessness, and religious persecution, especially of Jews in Eastern Europe. Polls to the U.S. included a U.S. reputation for political and religious freedom, economic opportunities that were afforded by the settling of the West, an abundance of industrial jobs in U.S. cities, and the introduction of large steamships and relatively inexpensive one-way passage. Now, the old immigrants were people who came up through the 1880s from Northern and Western Europe, like the British Isles, Germany, Scandinavia. Most were Protestants, although many were Irish or German Catholics. They mostly spoke English and they had a high level of literacy and occupational skills. Now the new immigrants, these tended to come from Eastern Europe um, and Southern Europe, Italians, Greeks, Croats, Slovaks, Poles, Russians. Most were poor and illiterate who had left autocratic countries. Um, they were mostly Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, and Jewish, and they crowded into poor ethnic neighborhoods in New York, Chicago, and other major U.S. cities. So if you look at the map of Europe in 1900, we have a large amount of people coming from uh, Southern and Eastern Europe. So restrictions on immigration included the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 um, and restrictions on undesirable immigrants like poor people, criminals, convicts, and anybody diagnosed as mentally incompetent, and also restriction of temporary workers to protect American workers. Here are some political cartoons that are anti-Chinese. Um, there also was proposed literacy test for immigrants. Um, it was vetoed by President Cleveland, but then it was ultimately passed in 1917. Ellis Island in New York opened in 1892, where new arrivals had to pass rigorous medical testing and pay a tax before entering the United States. So at the turn of the century, almost 15% of the US population were immigrants. Um, restriction of immigration was supported by various groups like labor unions, um, nativist societies, which were openly prejudiced, social Darwinists, and um, during a severe depression, economic wise in the 1890s, foreigners were a convenient scapegoat for the jobless. Urbanization and industrialization also developed simultaneously. Cities provided laborers and a market for factory made goods. Um, those moving into cities were immigrants and internal migrants born in rural United States. African Americans also moved from farms to cities. Now, we also have improvements in urban transportation where people were able to live in residences many miles from their jobs and commute to work. The upper and middle classes moved to suburbs to escape pollution, poverty, crime, um, and then older sections of the city were left to the working poor, many of whom were immigrants. This contributed to a lot of class, race, ethnic, and cultural divisions. Um, so if you look, these are the construction of bridges and rail cars and essentially subway systems. 
skyscrapers started to become a thing. Um, elevators and central steam heating allowed for um, comfort in bigger buildings. Um, in ethnic neighborhoods, we have slums and tenement apartments. Tenement apartments were small windowless rooms to maximize profits. Uh, New York City had to pass a law in 1879 requiring each room to have a window, so tenement owners would build ventilation shafts into the center of the building to provide windows for each room. It didn't really fix the problem. <laughs> Overcrowding and filth um, in tenements promoted the spread of deadly diseases like cholera, typhoid, and tuberculosis. Often these ethnic neighborhoods were called ghettos due to being crowded, unhealthy, and crime-ridden. Immigrant groups could maintain their own languages, cultures, churches, temples, and social clubs um, in these ethnic neighborhoods. Many groups even supported their own newspapers and schools, and these areas often served as springboards for the ambitious and hardworking immigrants and their children to achieve their version of the American dream. So top left is a Jewish neighborhood on the Lower East Side of New York City. Um, bottom left is a Ju uh, German library in Little Germany on the Lower East Side of New York City. Uh, top right is Little Italy in Manhattan and a Czech shoe store in Chicago on the bottom right. Fun fact, my grandfather actually uh, grew up in an ethnic neighborhood um, in Chicago. So definitely understand the importance of ethnic neighborhoods in my family. Um, factors that promoted Americans to move to the suburbs. There was abundant land available at very low cost. It was inexpensive to travel by rail. There were low cost construction methods. Um, there was also a lot of ethnic and racial prejudice. And we see the rise of American fondness for grass privacy and detached individual houses, which we enjoy largely here in our suburb of Washington, D.C. Um, political machines were political parties that were organized in major cities that came under the control of tightly organized groups of politicians. Each machine had a boss who was the top politician who gave orders to everybody else. And then Tammany Hall in New York City started as a social club, later developed into a power center political machine. Successful bosses knew how to manage competing social, ethnic, and economic groups. They brought modern services to the city and it became kind of a crude form of welfare. Um, they would help immigrants find jobs and apartments and help poor families with food. Uh, but they were often greedy and stole millions of dollars from taxpayers. So good and bad, I suppose. Um, books of social criticism included Henry George, who called attention to alarming inequalities in wealth caused by industrialization. Uh, his proposed solution was to replace all taxes with a single tax on land. Edward Bellamy envisioned a future era in which a cooperative society had eliminated poverty, greed, and crime. Now, we have concern for the lives of the poor with a number of young, well-educated men and women of the middle class settling into immigrant neighborhoods to learn about the problems that immigrant families faced firsthand. So Hull House in Chicago was started by Jane Addams, and in this settlement house, they taught English to immigrants, they pioneered early childhood education, they taught industrial arts, and established neighborhood theaters and music schools. By 1910, there were more than 400 settlement houses in America's largest cities. Settlement workers were civic-minded volunteers who created the foundation for the later job of social worker. They were also political activists who crusaded for child labor laws, housing reform, and women's rights. Now, social gospel was the importance of applying Christian principles to social problems. Um, they basically linked up Christianity to the progressive reform movement to get rid of a lot of social problems. Roman Catholicism grew pretty rapidly from new immigrants. 
Um, Protestants founded the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, which helped to adapt Christianity to urban life. And the Salvation Army was brought from England, and they brought basic necessities to the homeless and the poor while also preaching the Christian gospel. As for families in urban societies, parents and children were isolated from their extended family and village support, so we see a reduction in family size. Children were seen as an asset on the farm where their labor was needed at an early age, but in the city they became more of an economic liability. As for voting rights for women, um, Seneca Falls, 1848, where the National American Women Suffrage Association uh, fought to secure the vote for women. Wyoming was the first state to grant full voting rights to women. And by 1900, some states allowed women to vote in local elections and most allowed women to own and control property after marriage. The temperance movement uh, focused on total abstinence from alcohol. Um, by 1916, the Anti-Saloon League persuaded 21 states to close down all saloons and bars. Carry a Nation of Kansas uh, created a sensation by raiding saloons and smashing barrels of beer with a hatchet, pictured on the right. Public schools. So elementary schools after 1865 taught the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, and traditional values that were promoted in standard texts. Now we see a rise of compulsory education laws, which require children to attend schools, um, which also rose our literacy rate to 90% of the population by 1900. Thanks to our German immigrants, we now have kindergarten um, and a growing support for tax supported public high schools to provide vocational and citizenship education. Hey, welcome to where we are right here. Um, higher education, uh, we have a number of US colleges increasing in the late 1800s, thanks to land grant colleges established under the Federal Moral Acts. Um, so an example of that would be Virginia Tech. Um, universities were founded by wealthy philanthropists and the founding of new colleges for women. By 1900, 71% of colleges admitted women who represented more than one third of attending students. So yay for women in this. The college curriculum changed in the late 19th century to increase uh, the teaching of modern languages and the sciences um, and a focus on advanced graduate studies with research and free inquiry. The social sciences, including psychology, sociology, anthropology, political science, um, all of these things kind of started to come out during this time period. And evolutionary theory influenced social scientists to study the dynamic process of human behavior instead of just logical abstractions. W.E.B. Du Bois was the first African-American to receive a doctorate from Harvard. He advocated for equality for blacks, equal access to education, and um, especially for the talented 10th of African-Americans. Scientific theory and methodology also influenced traditional work. We have Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. arguing that law should evolve with the times. Clarence Darrow argued that criminal behavior could be caused by a person's environment. And this led to a boost in progressive legislation and liberal reforms. So many of the popular works of literature in the post-Civil War years were romantic novels that depicted ideal heroes and heroines. Now we see a move into realism where Bret Hart depicted life in the rough mining camps, Mark Twain, um, where he was the first great realist revealing greed, violence, and racism in American society. Naturalism as well focused on how emotions and experience shape human experience. Uh, Stephen Crane focused on brutal urban environments, um, fear in human nature in the Civil War. Um, Crane died of tuberculosis at the age of 29. Um, Jack London wrote about nature versus civilization, and Theodore Dreiser uh, caused a sensation by talking about poor working girl in Chicago um, and shocking just the moral sensibilities of the time. <laughs> 
As for artwork at this time, um, you can see Winslow Homer painted seascapes and watercolors, and he rendered scenes of nature in a very matter-of-fact way. Thomas Eakin um, wrote, uh, painted surgical scenes and everyday lives of working class men and women, and he used serial action photographs to study the human anatomy and paint it much more realistically. Um, James McNeil Whistler was born in Massachusetts, but spent most of his life in Paris and London, and he painted arrangement in gray and black, known as Whistler's mother, seen there on the right, it hangs in the Louvre. Mary Cassatt spent time in France learning Impressionism, um, which you can see the quick impressions of light um, in her artwork here. George Bellows was from the Ashcan School of Painting, where he painted scenes of everyday life in poor urban neighborhoods. Um, they tend to be darker, grittier. Upsetting to realists and romanticists alike were the abstract, non-representational paintings exhibited in the Armory Show in New York City in 1913. Art of this kind would be rejected by most Americans until the 1950s when it finally achieved respect among collectors of art. Included in this show were Delacroix, Monet, Van Gogh, Cezanne, Monet, Kirchner, Matisse, Picasso, and many more. As for architecture, um, there was a focus based on medieval Romanesque style of massive stone walls, rounded arches to give gravity and stateliness to functional commercial buildings. Pictured on top is Trinity Church in Boston, and on the bottom is Oaks Ames Memorial Hall in Massachusetts. Um, Louis Sullivan of Chicago was part of the Chicago School of Architectural Thought. He rejected historical styles, looking for a suitable style for tall steel-framed office buildings and a focus on aesthetic unity. Frank Lloyd Wright was an employee of Sullivan's and he became the most famous architect of the 20th century. He developed more of an organic style of architecture that was in harmony with nature and its surroundings. Um, it exemplified, it's exemplified through the long horizontal lines of his prairie style houses. Uh, Daniel Burnham continued historical styles like classical Greek and Roman styles, which you can see pictured here. Um, Frederick Law Olmsted not only designed parks, parkways, campuses, and suburbs, but he established the basis for later urban landscaping. So he specialized in this planning of city parks and scenic boulevards. By 1900, most large cities had either an orchestra, an opera house, or both, whereas smaller towns had outdoor bandstands for entertainment. The greatest innovators of the era included African Americans in New Orleans. Jelly Roll Morton and Buddy Bolden expanded the audience for jazz, which combined African rhythms with European instruments and mixed improv with structure. Scott Joplin and his Maple Leaf Rag sold nearly one million copies of sheet music. As for blues music, it expressed the pain of the Black experience, which we see a rise of during this time period. As for the popular press, there's the mass circulation of newspapers um, that were filled with sensational stories of crimes and disasters and so on. There was also the mass circulation of magazines. Um, due to new printing technologies that made magazines cheap. As for amusements, we have the growth of leisure time activity where there's a gradual reduction in hours people work, um, there is improved transportation, there's new advertising, there's this decline of restrictive Puritan and Victorian values that discourage wasting time on play, um, which led to parks in the countryside and people could enjoy picnics and outdoor recreation. The most popular form of recreation was drinking and talking at the corner saloon. Theaters that presented comedies and dramas flourished in most large cities, but vaudeville, with its various acts, uh, drew the largest audience. The National Rail Network encouraged traveling circuses like Barnum and & Bailey and the Ringling Brothers 
to create circus trains that moved a huge number of acts and animals from town to town as, quote, the greatest show on earth. Also very popular was the Wild West show brought to urban audiences by Buffalo Bill Cody and headlining personalities like Sitting Bull and the Marks woman Annie Oakley. Spectator sports also grew during this time, like boxing, which attracted male spectators from all classes. Baseball. So now we have owners organizing teams into leagues, a lot like trusts. Uh, it recalled a rural past of green fields and fences and was definitely an urban game. In 1909, President William Howard Taft started the tradition of the president throwing out the first ball of the season, and baseball became the national pastime. Unfortunately, Jim Crow laws prevented blacks from playing on all-white big league teams until 1947. Football also was a big deal during this time period. It was developed primarily as a college activity. The first game was played by Rutgers and Princeton, and professional teams and leagues were organized in the 1920s. Basketball was invented in 1891 at Springfield College, Massachusetts, and within a few years, high schools and colleges had teams, and then 1898 was the first professional basketball league. Spectator sports were largely played and attended by men. Um, it was a bachelor subculture of single men in their 20s and 30s whose lives centered around saloons, horse races, and pool halls. It took years for some spectator sports to gain middle-class respectability like boxing and football. And then amateur sports also rose during this time period where there's this idea of sports as healthy exercise for the body gaining acceptance. Women were considered unfit for most competitive sports. They were allowed to engage in recreational activities like croquet and biking. Uh, golf and tennis grew among the prosperous. The very rich pursued polo and yachting. And then clubs often discriminated against Jews, Catholics, and African-Americans. Shocker, racism prevails.